Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. So here let's see a high-level overview of how to build a game just like Assassin's Creed Mirage. I'm going to cover all of these mechanics and how I would go about building them. I made a page on the website with links to all of the tutorials that I'm going to reference, it's linked in the description. Basically this is a new format that I'm trying out, going through a game or a specific genre and doing a high-level overview of the various mechanics and referencing the various tutorials where I've covered them in detail. Hopefully if you're trying to build something similar to any of these mechanics then this can be quite useful. I simply don't have the time to make super detailed step-by-step -step courses on every single game, every single genre imaginable, but I think this quick format can be useful to help point you in the right direction. As with everything that I do, this is just an experiment, so do let me know in the comments if you find this format useful, like the video and subscribe if you do. Okay, so here let's see a nice high-level overview of how to build a game like Assassin's Creed Mirage. I play the game and I analyze it, so here are the mechanics that I'm going to cover. Personally, I always really enjoy these Assassin's Creed games. I love historical medieval stuff, and I love open worlds with lots of stuff to do. Traversing that open world is one of the crucial things. So speaking of that, the main thing you probably think of when you think of Assassin's Creed is the parkour system. Basically how you can just look at a wall, then simply run towards it, and the character jumps and grabs onto every hole point and everything looks great and climbs all the way up to the top. Now this is one of those mechanics where if you're a beginner this might seem impossibly complex, but in reality building something like this is actually relatively simple. Or rather I should say, the difficulty in building a mechanic like this is not necessarily in terms of logic complexity, the difficulty is simply in the massive amount of work required to build all of the unique animations, set up all of the home points on every single wall in the entire game, doing all of that for a large world is obviously a ton of work, a ton of animations, a ton of edge cases, a ton of stuff, so it is very laborious but in terms of logic it's actually quite simple. Basically you need to define what exactly is a home point, and then as the player moves pretty much just need to figure out which one is the closest home point that matches the player's input. So for example over here in this scenario, this one is marked as a home point, this little white here, this is also a home point, this is a home point, this one as well, as is that one, as is up there, and so on. So all of these are individual home points, that again were marked either manually or automatically through some algorithm. In terms of the logic itself, they can simply be just letters with a basic script on top, Maybe that script could then have a reference to a scriptable object that defines all of the data on that specific home point, like saying that this one over here, this one is a wire, whereas this one is just a little thing coming out. Then the logic in the player itself, the player would simply do a physics query around the player position, so right around here it would do some kind of circle to identify all of the home points near the player position. It also takes the player's inputs into account, so if the player is going in this direction, then it's not going to check for physics collisions all, all the way over here. So it checks for nearby home points through some kind of physics square, like an overlap sphere. Then it simply finds the closest one, although there can be multiple closest ones. So over here, all of these ones, all of these are pretty much around the same position. So as I'm going to move and jump, he's going to grab pretty much any of these. Then the system decides to pick which specific animation matches this one. So which specific animation goes from the player being over here on the floor to picking up some bar in here or this one here. So then in the game itself, if I just move forward and I jump, and there you go, he grabbed straight onto that one. I can move down, I can go onto this whole point, I can go up to that one, side to that one, and so on. And of course, while climbing, the controls become vertical. So the control vector, instead of being down on the XZ plane, instead of that, now it is up here on the XY, so move up or move to the side. And for these animations, they've got tons of animations, but they also have quite a bit of dynamicness to them. So as you can see, it always wraps on the exact same position. Now they don't have a million animations. They've got a couple hundred, maybe even a thousand, but they def definitely don't have millions of animations. So to handle dynamic animations, basically how do you handle dynamic logic on top of static animations? For that, you use inverse kinematics. Unity actually has a built-in tool to do inverse kinematics. It is called animation rigging. I made a tutorial on it. It is super useful, and super awesome for making your animations a lot more dynamic. Another crucial mechanic in these games is Eagle Vision. I think the original Assassin's Creed was actually one of the first games to popularize this mechanic, and afterwards the Batman Arkham games and Witcher 3, all of them implemented. It's a really interesting thing. Basically, you press a button and the world goes into this special vision mode where it highlights individual enemies, some helper allied units, and a bunch of items. So to build something like this, basically there are two ways to do it. Once again, you can do a simple physics query around the player, then you can locate all of the various objects that implement some kind of interface related to Eagle Vision, and then you can basically tell those objects in order to highlight themselves, so then they would change the material to change the shader to be more visible and so on. Or alternatively, you can just have the player, just the player, fire off some event when they enable Eagle Vision, and then all of the individual objects, all of them have a certain script on them, and then that script listens to that event, so when the player enables this mode, and checks the distance towards the player, and if close enough, then enables that visual. So those are the two main ways you can do something like this. In terms of visual for achieving this, this is any kind of shader you want. For the post-processing, the black and white, so this is just the basic volume system, you can just desaturate the entire scene. 
And you would probably add some post-processing, so on these individual objects, once in this mode, then render them in a different way. For example, something similar that I did in my own game, Dinky Gardens. All of the objects have a specific shader, and when the player is close enough to them to be able to interact, then it simply changes the outline from black to white in order to show this is the active object. In terms of the visuals for the post-processing, changing from the desaturated into the regular world and so on, for that you can simply have two volumes, so you can use just the volume system to modify the post-processing, you can see how to do something like that, like in the video where I remade the mechanics from Verdun, including the gas system. Another mechanic related to that one is the eagle eye. So this is where the player can pretty much just spawn an eagle, and the eagle flies, and then the eagle can just look around and identify other objects. So I can move the cursor in order to tag a bunch of enemies. So I can tag that one, and that one, and so on. It can also find some special chests, some special objects, and so on. So once again, implementing something like this is actually rather simple. First, you need to be able to tell where exactly the eagle is looking at. So as I move the cursor, where exactly is the cursor over in the 3D world? So that is pretty much exactly like I covered in the mouse position in 3D video. Basically just do a recast from the camera position down to the terrain and figure out where it hits on that position. So one way would be to do just do a recast in order to find the mouse position over there on the floor on top of the castle. Then in there, simply do a sphere cast around that position to figure out if there's anything interactable within that area. And over there, then, yep, it would find this enemy and it would simply tag it. Now for identifying objects, the best way is to use an interface. That way you can identify both enemies as well as chests and any other kind of object. Interfaces are insanely useful and I highly recommend you to learn about them if you don't know them. They are so useful in so many scenarios. For example, I use interface in my own game tons of times all over the place. I think pretty much every single object in my game, things like the dinky, the player, all the various buildings, machines, and so on, so I think pretty much all of them implement at least one interface. Basically, with an interface, you can write code against that interface, and then the interface will allow you to identify any kind of object. So it can be a chest, it can be an enemy, it can be a special object, or anything like that. So related to that, it's the mechanic about tagging. So you can basically tag objects, and then I can exit the eagle mode, and the objects are still visible, so I can still see all the enemies. And importantly, I can see them actually through the walls. Again, for this one, several ways you can do this. In terms of the actual UI elements in the world, if you want to do that, place UI elements in the world, then you can make a world space canvas. With this, you can place UI elements, things like text, things like images, you can place them directly inside the world. Although they will be hidden by occlusion, which over here, that is not what we want if we want to see them through the walls. So to solve that, one option would be simply to use that method and then render them with a special material, with a special shader that doesn't actually write to depth, so it is always visible. Alternatively, another method is to use a stackable camera. So you can make one camera and that camera is standard. Then you can make another camera and define that one as an overlay camera and make sure the settings are exactly perfect. Then you go onto the first camera and you set the second camera as a stackable camera. Then as long as you make the second camera only render these UI elements, that means those UI elements will always live on top of the main world, on top of the main camera. Or of course, alternatively, you can simply convert all of these objects, convert them between world position into UI position, and then simply move some regular UI objects. Another unique mechanic about these games is the unveiling of the map. So basically you climb to the top of these various towers and as you do it unlocks more of the map. Now for implementing something like this you basically just have two versions of your map. You've got one where everything is locked and one where everything is unlocked. So you've got two separate textures. And then with those two textures you can basically use a separate mask in order to mix both of them in order to figure out which one should show the unlocked part and which one should show the unlocked part. I covered how to do a mask like that in the rover mechanic simulator cleaning video. So in order to build this mechanic, you would do the exact same thing. When the player gets to the top of the tower and synchronizes it, then you basically update the mass texture for that one specific tower. So basically each tower is going to have a related mass texture, probably through a scriptable object or something like that. And in terms of visuals for animating it, you could do it through a simple shader effect. Could be exactly like I covered in the Hades transition effect video. You basically just define a grayscale texture and then basically animate how that one shows the underlying texture. And then of course it's the icons themselves. So for this, you would probably just have the icons placed in the map by default. Then these icons would simply have a simple script. And in that script, they would have a reference to a specific tower. Then whenever the player unveils, whenever it synchronizes a brand new tower, that action would fire off an event. Then the icons over here on the map, they would listen to that event. When that happens, they would check the tower that they are linked to. Again, probably with a scriptable object. Check the tower, and if that tower was one that was synchronized, then make the icon visible. If not, just hide it. Then for something simple like the assassination, so this is just a basic interaction system. So I approach, and if I can interact and I'm close enough, then I can simply do a special animation, special interaction. There you go, pretty simple. It works for assassinating enemies and also for interacting with all kinds of objects in the world. This is just a basic interaction system, kind of like I covered in the How to Talk with NPCs video. 
all of the various interactable objects, they have some sort of collider just so they work with the physics query. So this would have a collider, this would have a collider, and so on. Then again, as usual, the same thing. So the player does a overlap sphere to find all of the interactable objects around. All of these objects would implement some kind of interactable interface. Then checks which one is the closest in order to show which button to input. And when the player triggers the action, then just triggers an interaction with that one object. With a system like this, you can easily create things like assassinations, you can set the blend in, interact with objects, steal things, loot things, and so on. Next up is the Stealth AI. So basically the enemies have various states. They can be idle, where they are really just patrolling around. Then if they spot you doing something bad, they will go towards the player and investigate. If they see the player doing something bad for long enough, then they go into attack mode. In that mode, they simply chase the player and attack. But then, if the player runs and breaks line of sight, if so, then the guards will investigate the last known player position. After some time, if they don't find the player, then they simply go back into the idle state. So all this is really just a super basic state machine. This is actually a topic that I've wanted to cover for quite some time. It's yet another mechanic that looks quite complex, but in reality is actually quite simple. I covered the super basic state machine in a video a very long time ago. Basically, the one in this game is using the exact same concept, just a bit more complex. For seeing if the player is visible by the enemy, you can just do a simple ray cast from the enemy position towards the player. Or more accurately, you can actually use a sphere cast because you never want the accuracy to be dependent on pixel perfect bases. So you always want to allow for a little bit something more forgiving. But at the same time, doing a sphere cast that only tests for a direct distance. Whereas you obviously don't want to detect the player if the player is behind the enemy. So to solve that, you can also incorporate a vector3 dot to check the angle. I did something like that in the backstab mechanic video where I made sure to make a special attack that only works on a backstab, meaning it only works if the player is behind the enemy. So if there's no obstruction and the player is in front of the enemy, then you increase an alert timer. If long enough, then just go into the investigate mode. And then for losing track of the player, that is really pretty much the same thing. You would do the same sphere cast to find out if the player is visible. And if the player stops being visible, then you basically just track that position, so the last known position where the player was visible. And then you simply tell the AI to move to that point. And then from there, really just move to random points between that area. If enough time passes and it still doesn't find the player, then simply go back into the idle state. One more related thing is simply enemies attracting other enemies. So for example, if this enemy finds something, then it would do some kind of sphere cast around its position and simply find all of the other enemies and simply tell them to attack on the same position. So you have the stealth enemy AI. It's another one of those things that looks pretty complex, but in reality is actually quite simple. Like I said, this is something that I would like to cover in a dedicated tutorial, doing some stealth enemy AI, so hopefully sometime soon I will have a dedicated video on exactly doing that. Now for some rapid fire quick ones. For viewing the enemies and the objects through the walls, for doing that you can use the render objects feature. I cover that in detail in one of the many lectures in my Ultimate Unity overview course. Then for the tunneling system, where the camera is placed dynamically behind the player and looking at the target. This is pretty much exactly what I built in my turn-based strategy course. The camera is placed dynamically on the shoulder of the shooting enemy whilst pointing towards the target enemy. So this really just involves some simple vector math to calculate the point right behind the player's shoulder and to the side. Then for the virtual cursor, the game is fully playable with the gamepad and whilst on the menu, the gamepad uses this really nice virtual cursor that identifies all the objects. I actually covered this in detail in a very recent tutorial. It is super easy to build when you use the input system. And I use the exact same thing in my own Steam game, Dinky Gardens. Personally, I find this sort of thing much better, much more intuitive for navigating regular menus, as opposed to the old school navigation system, which really just moves from button to button. Personally, I really prefer the mouse cursor virtual cursor system. But when using a mouse instead of a gamepad, the cursor goes into this custom hardware cursor. This is another thing that is pretty subtle, but makes your game look quite a bit more nice. So it's a nice little bit of polish. I made a tutorial on this and I even made a full-on asset on how to make this super easy, including how to support animated cursors. Then on the menu for checking out all the skills, each one of those skills has a nice accompanying video showing what it actually does and how it actually exists. This is another great thing, especially in terms of tutorials. As the saying goes, show, don't tell. For implementing this, you can easily build it using Unity's video player. It's a simple component where you can play some kind of video and then render it onto a texture, onto a material or so on. Then during loading, there are some hints. You can cycle through them, and this is really just some text. So for storing these hints, you can store them in a simple scriptable object. And in the scriptable object itself, instead of storing just a simple string, you can store a localized string, so you can use Unity's localization system. So you can use Unity's localization package in order to make all these strings easily localized. Same thing for the codex and database. So storing all of these things, all of this text, all of these images and so on, all of these topics, this is something you can store pretty easily in a ton of scriptable objects. That is pretty much the exact same thing I did in my own game for making the knowledge base. Okay, so that's a high level overview on how to make a game just like Assassin's Creed Mirage. Like I said, this is a new format that I'm trying out, basically doing a high level overview of various games and genres. 
I've already covered lots of separate tutorials on lots of things, and if you put them all together, you can build all kinds of games. I really don't have time to make 20 hour courses on every single game, every single genre imaginable, but I think hopefully this format can help at least point you in the right direction. So do let me know in the comments if you find this format useful, like the video and subscribe if you do. Alright, so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.